In the eighth tutorial in this series we're going to now talk about string handling operations which is a huge huge topic really. There are loads of different operations we can do on strings. I'm just going to go through the ones which I think are most important and crop up most often. The first thing I want to talk about is really a recap of something we've done previously talking about casting also called in this case if we're talking about strings string conversions if we're using strings as one of our data types we're going through. So as a reminder a string is a data type which uh, has a we have we surround it with quotes either single quotes or double quotes and really a string is text. We also have a character so a character is really just one character, one uh, letter, number or symbol, although in Python they don't differentiate between characters and strings, really a, str a character is just one uh, character in a string, they're not separate data types like they are in different languages. But very often we'll get user input and all user input comes as a string, so we so maybe have like a number and we're taking in user input, so let's get rid of Guido and say uh, enter a number. So even if we're wanting the user to enter a number, they're not actually going to enter a number. If I do, if I, if I do print type number and run this code, first of all, get prompted, enter a number like we've seen before. I can enter 65, press enter. And what this is doing here, we've got a function surrounding number, is finding out the data type. And so the data type, just to prove it to you, is a string, SDR being shorthand for string. So all inputs, even if they look like numbers to us, are classed as strings until we convert them, until we do some casting. So if I wanted to use this input in some calculation, I need to convert it to a number. You know, if I'm happy with it being an integer, I can just cast it to be an integer. And you do that by surrounding your variable with an int function. So the int function converts it from whatever it is, but in this case a string, to an integer. If I want it to be a float, which is a decimal, I can convert it to a float. This one is not shorthand, uh, like this. And now if I, in fact we can't call it float because that's already been used, uh, float, call it float var. We can't use our keywords because otherwise it would confuse it, as in we can't use them in identifiers. Now if I print these two, integer and float var, uh, we should see a slight difference. So I need to actually enter it again. So we get 65, which is the integer, and then 65.0, which is the float. So the integer does not have a decimal, float does. If I printed number plus number, and then printed integer plus integer, just adding itself in both cases, but one of them, the first line, number plus number, these are both strings still, but the integers are integers. And so this is an example of how the plus operator is really overloaded. It, it works in two different ways, depending on data types. The first way it works, if I just go through this again, first way it works is for uh, numbers, so it just adds normally, so 65 plus 65 is 130, but equally, if it has strings either side of it or characters, it will just put them together, and this operation is called concatenation. And by the way, if I do this in the shell, actually, just to be a little bit uh, more simple, if I do the equivalent casting for a character, which is chr, uh, char, and if I do, um, if I put, say let's do 65 into this, an integer, and press enter, I get capital A. This is because what this is doing is it's converting the decimal version of the ASCII code. So all characters in a computer are represented in binary, and we use a character set to do this, ASCII being uh, the most well known, which has now been extended into Unicode, a character set where every single character has got a unique code. So the unique code for A is 65, the unique code for B is 66 because it follows a nice pattern like that and when I say B I mean capital B because I believe, I might be wrong here, uh, 90, is 96 B? Let's see, uh, no it's not, maybe it's 98, it's one of the two, uh, fingers crossed, yeah 98 but lowercase b this time. Um, so essentially we are using that casting to convert from the integer value to the character itself. So if you want to find the ASCII code or the Unicode code uh, in decimal for any character, you can use the char for, uh, function, chr. To do the opposite, we use the ord function, ord being short for ordinal number. An ordinal number is a counting number, so a way of organizing sets. Um, and if we put in this, maybe just to do the reverse capital A like this, I'll get 65. And then if I want lowercase b uh, uh, like this, I should get uh, 98 which is a lesson for me as well. So ways of converting between characters and their uh, codes. 
Okay, why don't we get rid of some of this stuff to clean it up a little bit so I can show a few more things. Why don't we do a simple program where we uh, get the user to input their name, if that makes sense, and we can do a few different operations on it. So input their name, and one of the things we can do is find out how long their name is. So we can use a function which is shortened to len for length. So if I, by the way, if I just do len like this and like we might do in the shell, just leave it on its own outside of an, uh, outside of a print statement, and I put in uh, someone's name. Let's do Guido. Nothing will happen because this needs to be put inside a print statement. By the way, inside the interactive shell, you can just do it how it is, but you've got to make sure this is wrapped in a print statement. So this will find out how long. Make sure it's in brackets because all built-in functions need to have an argument put in via brackets. So we've got a nested function here. Do Guido again. If I can spell his name right and uh, Guido is five letters long, five characters long, and so we get five outputted. And one thing that's important to know about strings is that we um, strings are arranged like lists are. We'll look at lists in a future video, but it means we can do what is known as indexing. So let me swap to the shell to do this, just setting Guido, assigning Guido to the name variable over here. So we can do indexing, and indexing is where we, after the name of our variable or just the string itself, we have square brackets, so not the kind of normal brackets like we have with functions, square brackets, and inside these square brackets we can put an index number. And so if I put an index number of 2 here and press enter, it's going to return just the character i. So each character in a string is given what is called an index number, and in almost all programming languages, including Python, these start counting from 0. So actually the capital G is got the zero index, the u has got the one index, and the i has got the two index, and so it's why we put, it's why when we put two in our index number we get i as opposed to the second one which is u, because we start counting from zero. If I do name with an index number of zero, I'll get capital G, and if I put name with an index number of the length of name minus one, I will get uh, the last letter which is o, because if I did a name with the length just on its own without subtracting one, I'm going to get an error because we're going out of range. Because we start counting at zero, the actual length, five, the fifth index is after our string, and so it doesn't, we can't access it because it doesn't exist. So even if we don't know how long the string is going to be, we can get the last letter by doing len name minus one, or alternatively, we can just do name with an index of minus one. So despite there not really being an index of minus one because they need to be positive integers, Python takes this to be the last index, so we can't have minus zero, but we can have minus one, which is the last letter. Likewise, if I do name with an index of minus two, this will be the second last, which is D in our case. So indexing on its own is really useful, of course, but it's also uh, part of other functions like slicing. So slicing is where we're trying to get a substring from our string, a substring being part of our original string. So here we've got Guido, a substring would be GY or DO or uh, UI or ID. All of these different substrings are part of our original string. And we can get access to that substring by slicing it using a very similar method. So you can type a name, you can also type in uh, the just raw string itself, follow it with our square brackets. And inside, the first thing we type is the index of the first character we want to include in our substring. So let's start at the, at the start with zero. Let's say I want to get a substring guid as opposed to guido. So I follow this first index with a colon. And then I'll write the last index I want. And in fact, this is not the index, it's not the last index we want, it's the index after the one we want. So if I want to end at D, D is the 0, 1, 2, third index. But actually, I'll write down 4 here because the second parameter, the second value supplied, is the one after the one we want to keep. So this will get us grid because even if we've got 4, which is really the index of, Z, of O, it's ignoring that, it's just stopping before it. So if I wanted no real reason of doing this. If I wanted the entire uh, substring, I could put an index of five, and this would work. If I just did Guido and did an index of five on its own, this would give us an error because five is out of range. But I can include it here because we're not actually using that index, we're stopping before it. If I am going all the way to the end, I don't need to actually include that second parameter. I can just, if I want to start at say index two, I can just leave it like that, not put a second value in, but still put the, the colon in and I get IDO. 
in this case. We can also, like before, use negative indexing to try and work backwards. So if I want to start at uh, the minus second index, so second from last, add a colon, leave it like that, I get just the last two characters, D and O, that is my substring. There is a third parameter to a slicing operation, which is called a step. So if I leave the first two parameters empty here and put a step of uh, so 2 and close it off, this will get every second character. So I get Geo from Guido because it's going every second character like that. Another cool thing to do, if you want to swap your string around, if you want to do a reverse operation, you can again leave the first two parameters. If you want to, and do minus 1, and this will reverse your string and make it go back to front. Okay, so I'm showing you that I have completely forgotten about my program I started on the left on script mode. So let's just go back to this. Uh, let's just, instead of doing an input, let's just set it to be uh, Grace Hopper, just so we can use her name as an example. So print length name could say uh, your name is uh, length characters long, like that. Um, we could also use some of the slicing, maybe say your name backwards is and then use that minus one step like we did down here. So once I fix a couple of the errors we get a output like this, name is 12 characters long, the name backwards is, I won't even try and say this. This does look a little bit funny because you know I would think we'd try and surround this in quotes ideally to make this look a bit nicer. But the issue is because we're using quote marks to define our string we can't just easily put a quote in our string because it causes it to think that actually that string is ended, which it hasn't. We get around this by doing something called escaping the, the string, which, uh, esca escaping the quote really, which is a fancy way of just putting a backslash before our quote mark to tell Python that actually the following character is to be ignored by it, is to just be shown to the user, not processed, um, because otherwise it will use it to stop the string. So if I do something like this, and then put another quote down here and make sure I escape this quote mark. It looks a bit weird in our program, but what it will do is it will ignore the quote in terms of stopping my string, but it will just show it to the user here. And so it looks a little bit better. We've still got this gap because the separator is a space, but um, at least it's um, a little bit different. If we want to see if our string has got a particular substring, like in this one, let's see if it's got grace, we can do something like um, so we can do grace in name and actually this on its own will give us a boolean value so let's set this to uh, <laughs> uh, contains grace equals this because grace in name is going to evaluate to a boolean value uh, either true or false depending on if grace is in the name or not so in is an identity operator which works in quite a complicated way but all it does here is just seeing if grace is inside this string so let's run this. If I then print out uh, contains grace, which sounds a bit strange, but that's okay, um, we should see that this is true, which it is because grace is in this. And if we just put anything before this and then run it again, it's still going to find grace because it's looking throughout the entire string for the substring grace. If I want to see if the substring is not in our string, I can instead just add my Boolean operator not before in. And then, oh, in this case, because grace is in for sub is in the string, I get false. But that's another way of doing the opposite operation, seeing if our substring is not in our string. If I want to get the index of where this is, I can do something like print uh, name dot find and inside write grace. We can find a single character, but you can do a, a substring as well. And this will return the index of the first instance of the substring. So the seventh index is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it starts off finding it over here in the seventh index. That's quite useful. There are loads of different functions and methods for strings and it's best just to Google them honestly if you are trying to find any in particular. Things like making uppercase or upper, lower does the opposite, makes it lowercase. Um, loads of similar functions like that. And by the way, there is a difference between, can we see up here we've got a, what we call a function. We have a function name followed by brackets. Print is a function as well, len and also input is a function. Whereas down here we have find and upper. These are not functions, they work in similar ways. These are methods technically because we write them after a dot. So we write our variable, which is an object in this case, and we have a dot and we're using this method on our object. Now that's not really that important right now, but it's worth mentioning why I might call this a method, find, whereas I would call len or print a function. A function does not work on an object, but a, a, um, a method does. 
For this try now, I'd recommend you have a go at these two problems. So actually doing some programming this time, not just predicting. So the first one, trying to take a, in this case, a four digit year and multiplying the first two digits together with the last two digits requires some of our string handling we've talked about, some of the slicing. And for the second exercise, a little bit more complex, we have got three conditions which we want a password to be. And this will become a little less awkward once we do selection in the next video, but we can still, based on what we've done in this video, output something like this based on an input like this, which breaks uh, two of our conditions and passes one of them. So pause the video, have a go at these two exercises. There'll be sample solutions in the description.